We've got some projected SEC over under win totals for the 2024 season. Where does Oklahoma land? Let's find out on Locked On Sooners. You are Locked On Sooners, your daily podcast on the Oklahoma Sooners. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. What's up, Sooner Nation? Welcome to Locked On Sooners. Today's episode is brought to you by FanDuel. Make every moment more. New customers join today and you'll get $200 in bonus bets. If your first bet of $5 or more wins, visit FanDuel.com slash Locked On to get started. My name is John Williams. You can follow me on Twitter at John9Williams. My buddy here is Josh Homer. You can follow him on Twitter at Josh on Ref. The show is at Locked On Sooners. And leading off the show, we're going to talk projected win totals for 2024 in the SEC, off the top, the Oklahoma Sooners, according to Athlon Sports, coming in with a win total projection of eight and a half. Where does that sit with you as we sit here in February, Josh? I mean, I, I feel like I want the over on the win total. It'd be disappointing if Oklahoma can't win nine games. It's a challenging schedule that obviously uh, features a bunch of good teams. Texas, uh, of course, you know that's there. Alabama, LSU, where you're closing down the stretch. Missouri, Old Miss, you got a road trip to to Auburn as well. So uh, Tennessee at home, I, I get all that, but it's Oklahoma, and uh, you know the non-conference portion. You feel like you feel like you should rack up three right there. There's nothing really in the non-conference. Tulane has been good, but uh, you ought to be able to take care of business versus Tulane. Houston, you ought to be able to take care of business versus Houston. I know that uh, that's a, a Big 12 opponent now, but it's not uh, there's there's no Ohio State in that non-conference portion of the schedule or insert uh, other perceived national title favorite or a uh, highly ranked opponent in the non-conference portion. So, I feel like you can you can stock 3 right there and then win 6 out of the the other 9. And there you go. There, there's your over. Yeah, and I, I tend to lean that way as well. I, I know we've gone back and forth on this where, okay, there's a path for Oklahoma to get to 10, 11 wins in 2024. But if the offensive line doesn't come together, which I, I don't think anybody's thinking it's not going to come together, you could certainly foresee a scenario where, okay, we're flirting with that under a little bit. We're flirting. Okay, are they going to get to eight wins? Is that going to be a question? As you go into November, I mean, that that November stretch is going to be tough. You know, the the non-conference game that you've got there against Maine, that's that late in the season. OK, you should be good to go on that one. But Missouri, although Missouri is good, I feel good about Oklahoma going into Columbia and, and winning that game. Again, Eli Drinkwitz and the Tigers have only won more than six games one time. 2023. Can they repeat that next year? That's going to be the big question mark for the Tigers. A talented team, no doubt, adding talent year after year and should continue to get better. But are they going to be trustworthy to expect them to hold serve against an Oklahoma team that is also getting better every single year? And, and so, yeah, I, I don't I don't hate where the projection is, but I certainly would lean to the over on that front. You go look at FanDuel, our partners here on the Locked On Network, they've got Oklahoma sitting at six and a half for a projected win total. And if I was in a state that allowed me to go to FanDuel right now and lay some money on that six and a half, I would definitely be taking that over because I would find it really, really hard to believe that Oklahoma doesn't get to seven wins in 2024. That'd be yeah, that crazy to me. That's so, a wild number. Yeah, that's a wild number. I'm not sure exactly where it would rank amongst SEC teams, but I was curious. So I wanted to go check it out over at FanDuel and see, okay, what do they got for Oklahoma? Six and a half. Uh, and to me, that's a smash the over hard right now as we sit here on February the 9th. Oh, it'd be a disaster season. If, uh, if Oklahoma doesn't get to seven wins, then I, I mean, I don't think Brent Venables would be back in – in uh, 2025. I mean, that that's the kind of season where I think he would lose his job. Uh, you know, I get that, you know, depending upon what's going on in the recruiting class or this or that, but 
that would be a disaster season for Oklahoma. And I, I don't think we're in any uh, – I, I don't think we have to worry about that being the case for OU. You know, eight wins, okay, uh, an eight and four season, I could see that uh, as a possibility. I don't think that's playing out either. I mean, I told you right off the top, I would uh, I would slam the over on eight and a half. I'm surprised that that number's not nine and a half just to, to force people to – Kind of okay. Well, how how much? I guess a lot of people would probably play the the under there, but maybe even see that number at nine would be a little bit more challenging to where you're you're you know really playing for the the push there. Or obviously uh, they got to have a great season to go over it and under it. They'd have to be you know fair, fairly disappointing for Oklahoma. So to me, I, I think uh, unlikely that Oklahoma doesn't get to nine. I mean, there's not a lot of love right now out there for the Sooners because you also go look at FanDuel and they've already got some of the games for the 2024 season out there. Some early, early, early odds right now. And, and Oklahoma's a 10 and a half point underdog to the Texas Longhorns in that game. Again, this is going to be a better Oklahoma team than what we saw last year and maybe not as good of a Texas team as what we saw last year. And, I, and when I say better, it's going to be better on the defensive side of the ball. And I think your your skill positions are better than what they were. And we'll see about Jackson Arnold. Can he be as good as Dylan Gabriel was in that game? That'll be a great question. But I think defensively, you're certainly better. And I don't think that Texas has gotten better over the offseason. Have they gotten much worse? I don't necessarily think that's the case either. But I don't think that there's a 10 and a half point separation between the two sides as we sit here right now on you know, early February. Now with the understanding that Oklahoma has relative to the rest of the sec, the most challenging slate, right? I, I think yeah. that's fair to say Oklahoma has got the most difficult slate. So that obviously is getting factored in here a little bit, but w with that in mind, Oklahoma's regular season win total from FanDuel at six and a half, John, that is one game better than Arkansas at five and a half that's the same over under six and a half as kentucky that is uh the same over under six and a half as auburn that's one game better than florida so that to me is yeah that's pretty wacky yeah that, that's a that's a hard group to be in if we're just looking at the projected win totals i don't see texas and i'm not sure why they don't have a texas win total up uh but i gotta imagine given that They've got Texas as a 10 and a half point favorite over Oklahoma that they're probably in the nine and a half to 10 and a half win total projection, according to FanDuel. But yeah, right now, I mean, I, I'm not liking the disrespect that uh, the betting sites are, are throwing towards Oklahoma. Now, you know, they've got a lot of things they got to improve and they've got to get that offensive line to come together and they've got to see Jackson Arnold take a step this off season and be the guy that everybody expects him to be. But yeah, I mean, it's it's hard to sit here and see any path to Oklahoma going under eight and a half, according to Athlon Sports, or six and a half, according to FanDuel. I, it would be a mitigated disaster if you're just hoping to hit that seven over. Uh, that would be not great. Now, would it get Brent Venables canned? I don't necessarily think so. I can, I might kind of disagree with you there. I think they're going to continue to be patient and continue to build this thing, but the seat would get really, really hot and the patience was at least among the fan base would start to wear thin. If you're barely getting to seven wins in 2024. Well, and if you go under and you finish with six wins in a regular season is uh, sort of where mentally I was at on it, but oh, yeah, yeah. then you're probably gone. You know? So, I mean, in, when you're saying six and a half, I mean, the under's in play, right? So if you, you go under that, then uh, I, I don't think you'd be back. So that's just kind of crazy. Obviously, they think a lot about Texas, uh, FanDuel. You mentioned the Oklahoma spread, but just for comparison's sake, because even though Georgia didn't win a national championship, most people feel like, okay, maybe Georgia – I shouldn't say most people. A lot of people felt like maybe Georgia was still the most talented team a year ago, and they've got Georgia favored by just a point and a half right now over texas they've also let's see here got uh texas favored by two and a half over defending national champion michigan which th th there's a lot of uh turnover for michigan so that that part but basically they're saying 
Texas pretty close to Georgia right now and 10 and a half points better than Oklahoma. So where can I go put some money on Georgia, please? Where? Because, oh, I can go to FanDuel if I were in a state that allowed me to do such things. So go to FanDuel Sportsbook at FanDuel.com slash locked on where you can make every moment more. A quarterback who's hoping to make every moment more with the Oklahoma Sooners potentially uh, is showing up on the radar after receiving an offer on Thursday. There was a projection already placed favoring the Sooners. We'll talk about who this guy is and what he brings to the table coming up next here on Locked On Sooners. Showtime. Well, it's just about here for Super Bowl 58. And that means that uh, it's time to hunker down like us, get on that couch and uh, get after it with the FanDuel Sportsbook where you can still find a win or two or three. FanDuel Sportsbook is uh, celebrating with you for this Super Bowl. You uh, place a $5 bet, win it, and you've got $200 in bonus bets guaranteed. That's any $5 bet for first-time users that win. The uh, Super Bowl 58 numbers, uh, latest we've got. San Francisco, two-and-a-half-point favorites still over Kansas City. Uh, At this point, I don't think the thing's swinging three points. San Francisco is going to be a favorite in this Super Bowl. Minus 130 for San Francisco on the money line. The uh, That over under that total number hasn't really shifted this week. Still sitting at 47 and a half. Uh, I, I like that thing to stay below that number. Anytime touchdown scores, some of those numbers for you. Christian McCaffrey, minus 230. Uh, Isaiah Pacheco, minus 125. Travis Kelsey, minus 105. I sort of feel like uh, I'd be shocked if McCaffrey doesn't find the end zone at least once in this game. But uh, head on over to FanDuel. That's America's number one sports book. FanDuel.com backslash locked on FanDuel, an official sports book partner of the NFL. And all of our recruiting segments here on the Locked On Network are brought to you by LinkedIn. Go post your job for free at linkedin.com slash locked on college. That's linkedin.com slash locked on college to post your job for free. Terms and conditions apply. The Oklahoma Sooners have another quarterback on their radar in 2026 quarterback, Darian Coleman uh, out of Orlando, Florida. He's currently an unranked or unrated prospect across the recruiting services. Nobody's really done their evaluation on him just yet, but he received an offer from the Oklahoma Sooners on Thursday and Not long after that, one Parker Thune of OU Insider and Rivals issued a future cast favoring the Oklahoma Sooners for Mr. Coleman. He reminds me not entirely, uh, you know, with the the speed or this or that, just the sheer uh, running electricity, but with his release point, a lot of Lamar Jackson, he kind of looks like Lamar. The way that uh, he he lets the the football loose, it is not traditional, uh, you know, fully upstairs. It's kind of that three quarters release, but uh, man, he can really sling it. And I do like the way that he runs. I say he's not quite as athletic. He's very, very mobile. You know, Lamar Jackson, that uh, freakish athleticism of the, you know, Kyler Murray ilk. But Darian Coleman, I I really uh, like the way that he runs the football. He appears to be just flick of the wrist, effortless uh, thrower. And contrary to some of the uh, quarterbacks that we we watched uh, recently, he, at least in the tape that I saw, not that he won't take off and run. He's he's certainly capable of doing that and is a very able and uh, explosive runner when he wants to be. Just watching his tape, it looks like he was very committed to being a pocket passer. It looked like very much uh, he's trying to compute, okay, where am I throwing this football first? And then if uh, all of that other stuff breaks down or it's a designed quarterback run, take off it and show off the feet. So I really liked what I saw. I thought the tape look, looked good. Yeah, he, I think he's a very accurate passer. Uh, to all levels of the field, he looks like he's de- he does have a quick release, which, I mean, the release may look different than what you traditionally might look for in a quarterback, but get the ball out of your hands. That's the name of the game. Get it out on time and get it on target. And Darian Coleman does a great job of doing that. And and I think you, know, you look at what they're looking for in a quarterback, and he kind of checks all the boxes. You know, an accurate passer with a – the ability to throw to all levels, all directions, and then somebody who's mobile and able to to make some plays with his legs. 
either in the scramble game or in the design quarterback run game. He's he's good at both. He does a really good job of avoiding pressure in the pocket. Uh, there are a few plays in his highlights where you know the the pressure just came right up the middle, and he was able to step away from that, avoid the rush, get outside, and still make a very accurate pass on the run. Now, I, I you know the off platform stuff that gets very much exaggerated in this day and age. And yes, it's good to be able to do that. But I think, and he does a good job at throwing when things are breaking down at the same time. I also want to see a quarterback that's able to throw from a clean pocket or manipulate the pocket to make his pocket clean. And I think Darian Coleman does a really, really good job at that. I, I like that. He's not always just throwing to wide open guys. He's throwing into tight coverage and he's putting the ball on the receiver where the receiver needs to get it. And it's not going to be playable for the defensive back. Uh, he does a good job throwing down the sidelines and, and giving the, the receiver an opportunity to run under the football. You know, throwing that deep ball isn't just about getting it out there. It's getting it out there in such a way that the receiver is able to run under it and make a play on the ball. Uh, yeah, arm strength matters, but sometimes it can be a little bit overrated too because you can overthrow your receivers on a regular basis and – having deep ball accuracy is more than just having a big arm. And I think he does a really good job in the deep passing game. But I also like the way that he's able to throw the the flare to the running back, um, you know, coming out of the backfield. He, he throws that on time and with good accuracy. So I like what he does in all levels of the field. You know, obviously he's, he's going to be shorter in stature to, you know, uh, phase on who we talked about not long ago. And then, and then the top quarterback in the recruiting class, um, as well, Jared Curtis, but that doesn't necessarily mean that he can't be a highly productive passer, uh, a la Kyler Murray or Baker Mayfield, Johnny Manziel, you know, some of these shorter quarterbacks, a Chris Leak, you know, back into the you know mid to 2005 to 2006 uh, range of quarterback play. So a lot to like about him, and it seems like he likes Oklahoma quite a bit based on Parker Thune's uh, future cast projection. Yeah, whether it's Faison Brandon or Jared Curtis or Darian Coleman or a couple of these names out of uh, those three, the, the most recent offers for uh, Oklahoma, one thing we know to be true, and we have known this for quite some time, really uh, dating back to, you know, we, we talked about Josh Heupel in our last episode and what he did for the program, but uh, really – from the moment that uh, Bob Stoops was hired, right? And one of the first things he and company did is let's get Josh Heupel to Norman and let's get Jason White to Norman. They accomplished both of those things. And basically the quarterback train for Oklahoma, for the most part, hasn't really looked back since. Oklahoma has been a place where great quarterback play lives and where the next great quarterback comes to play college football. So whether, again, it's uh, Darian Coleman, who it's clearly, according to Parker Thune, trending in a positive direction, it looks like very quickly here, OU's going to find athletic, talented quarterbacks that for the most part can make all the throws, probably have uh, quite a bit of mobility to them. And Darian Coleman, to me, is uh, no different in that regard. You follow the offer sheet, like always. This is early in this recruitment as uh, the 247s and rivals and ESPNs and on threes of the world are still figuring out, okay, well, who, where does everybody in the 26th class shake out? Well, I mean, obviously this is going to be three-star, blue-chip type kid and up because, look, he's got an offer from Nebraska, got an offer from Arkansas, Illinois, we, we know Oklahoma, Old Miss, Pitt, a and uh, Virginia Tech, West Virginia. So there's a lot of big-time programs that are clued into the fact that, yeah, Darian Coleman's a, a big-time talent. Yeah. And so it's just a matter of time until his evaluation comes through and we start seeing some star ratings on Coleman. We'll see where he lands in the hierarchy. By the time we get to 2026, one final recruiting nugget before we turn our attention to the opening day for the 2024 softball season, Ryan Foje, who we talked about uh, earlier this week, who committed to Oklahoma out of the blue. We said he's going to be a blue chipper by the end of the cycle. Well, it did not take very long. Ended up getting his fourth star from rivals uh, just the other day. So this is a guy that's on a very uh, nice upward trajectory. So continue to keep an eye on that. I mean, where he's at now, I don't think is where he ends up ranked. He's going to, I think he's going to end up even ranked higher than that. He'll, I think he could end up pushing for five-star territory by the end of the cycle. 
We got a bunch of five stars on Oklahoma's softball team. They started the season out with a bang. We'll talk about it here coming up on Locked On Sooners, your team every day. The Oklahoma Sooners opened the season on Thursday with a pair of wins first over Utah Valley 13 to nothing in run rule fashion and then got the 3 nothing shutout of the top 10 ranked Duke Blue Devils as well in the Puerto Vallarta College Classic. Uh man, that first game Utah Valley Oklahoma is able to load the bases Cassidy Pickering comes through with a grand salami in her first career collegiate at bat. You couldn't write the story any better for her. And then Alyssa Brito and Kinsey Hansen go back to back later in the game. Nicole May pitches three innings, a one hit ball. Uh, then you see Kirsten Deal come in for an inning and Peyton Monticelli as well. So the Oklahoma Sooners depth coming through already we saw ella parker have a big you know rbi a two rbi single that ended up turning into her coming all the way around to score so we're, we're seeing the true freshman come through in pickering and parker and then we're also seeing the the depth of the pitching staff already coming through on day one against duke kelly maxwell man made the most of her oklahoma sooners debut uh, five shutdown innings allowed a hit allowed a walk and those the the hit came in the top of the first, the walk in the top of the second, and then after that, completely shut Duke down. Uh, and then, man, Tiari Jennings was able to break the game open in the third inning against Duke um, and, and with the solo home run, and that ended up being all that Oklahoma needed offensively. Fun uh, start to the season, as we sort of surmised that uh, it would be. But, uh, you know, interesting developments that Nicole May uh, did get the the – you know, the ball first in the circle of game one versus Utah Valley. Uh, obviously, Deal and Monticelli each got some work in that run rule victory as well. And, and then it was nice to see Maxwell have an extended look, pitch five innings against a, a good Duke team and, uh, and just being in control. Uh, it'd be an absolute control of it. I thought you hit on, you know, a couple of the, the biggest stories of the day which uh, to me was uh, Cassidy Pickering straight away, uh, not wasting any time saying, uh, yes, I am the, the next great freshman at the University of Oklahoma and in Parker too. So this uh, Oklahoma softball train, it just keeps rolling. If you're keeping track at home or trying to, that is now a 16 to nothing, a cumulative score two games in. And uh, a 55 game win streak currently. Uh, they'll they'll take on a tough Washington team on Friday night, which will will put it will be a test. Just like Duke was a test, Washington will be a test as well. And then they'll close it out with Long Beach State. But uh, you know it was it was good to see you know a number of team a number of players getting into the lineup and making things happen. You know we know this team is going to hit. They're going to hit well. And you know early in the season the results may not be what the expectations are, but they will put together big games after big games after big games. This is a good Duke team. Alex Duraco said it uh, when we met with her earlier this week to preview the season. This was the game that she had her eye on the most in this weekend because of what Duke was going to be capable of in 2024. And they showed that. I mean, they were they were tough. They had they have really, really good pitching and made things a little bit challenging. Uh, for Oklahoma's pitchers as well. You know, Peyton Monticelli ended up facing a bases loaded one out jam in the bottom or the top of the seventh that she had to work around. You know, she, she got the first out of the inning and then uh, gave up a single, sorry, a walk and then a single and then a hit by pitch to load bases and the game winning run is at the plate and she's able to get a strikeout and then a ground out to close the game out. So, you know, it, it was Already, we're seeing this team being able to respond to adversity and not just, you know, the stars of this team, Tiara Jennings, Jada Coleman, Alyssa Brito, you know, Nicole May, Kelly Maxwell. I mean, it's it's the new people too, showing that they are ready to contribute right away. And, and this is why you bring in a Kelly Maxwell and a Peyton Monticelli for big time opponents like Duke. Kelly Maxwell's pitched against everybody. She's she's been in all the big games. She's played in, in all the big games. 
women's college world series, big 12 tournaments across the country against the best of the best. You're able to match her up in any situation in against any opponent and feel really, really good about your chances of coming away with the victory. Peyton Monticelli, she saw all the big innings for Liberty and that's why you bring her in as well, because you can add that to your rotation, to your staff and feel really, really good about her ability to work out of jams like she did again on Thursday. So a great start in a lot of ways. You got to see explosive offense. You got to see timely hitting. You got to see, you know, offense leading to offense. You got to see really, really good defense. And then you got to see your pitchers dominate and also work out of jams too. Everything you said was exactly right, except you meant Carly Keeney. Carly uh, Keeney. Instead of Monticelli, Monticelli in, in game one, but uh, yeah, no, it was it was great to see for Keeney and uh, bad everybody. <laughs> no, it's all good. Hey, it's game two, right? I mean, come yeah. on, give us a break. But uh, yeah, I thought uh, each of the two new pitchers in game two that was great to see for both Maxwell and Keeney, and then uh, to just get a win like that this early in the season to score three in the third and uh, make it hold up was was very positive for Oklahoma. And now we get to see what it looks like uh, versus Washington will be a ton of fun as well. Yeah, it's going to be a ton of fun. I, I'm, I'll be curious who they go to uh, in the circle for that one. You know, they've, they've used arguably their top four pitchers so far uh, in the first two games. Uh, are they going to go with somebody like an SJ Guerin who they haven't used yet? Are they going to go with, uh, you know, back to Peyton Monticelli maybe, or are they going to go back to Nicole May? Uh, in a big spot. I, I'd like to see them go to Nicole May and give her that opportunity against a really good Washington team. And then it'll be curious to see how the lineup looks because we saw Tiara Jennings batting fifth uh, in these games or, or third. And so she's moved around the lineup a bunch already. Uh, and, and uh, you know, Patty Gass has not been shy about putting her true freshman up high in the lineup to give them opportunities uh, early in in the batting order. So just really curious to watch some of these things and and we'll have further takeaways after the weekend's over with what Oklahoma is able to do. We'll see how they handle a good Washington team. And then we'll be back again next week with Alex Tarocco to break down the weekend and then get you ready for the next week of Oklahoma softball. Uh, let's talk basketball just real quickly because, uh, you know, Oklahoma men's basketball had a nice win over BYU to rebound from what was a lackluster effort against UCF picked up. What was it? A 16 point win over a Cougars team that had only been held under 70 points four times this season, including a Tuesday night's win. And then the women's team, another big win first place in the big 12, a, a team that looked like they were going to miss the NCAA tournament for the first time under Jenny Baranchik. And now they look like, I mean, could they contend for a two seed at this point in the NCAA tournament? I, I don't think that that's not on the table. If they, you know, if they won out, yeah, they, they'd probably get it. Uh, they're, they're, I think to be, you know, more realistic about it, top four and up line, uh, you know, the top four seed would be, would be good. And then, you know, obviously the ability to, to host the, the first two games in the, uh, the NCAA tournament would be big for sooner women's basketball, but they've won seven straight. It's uh, sort of a take care of your business win versus TCU, and they they did just that. Skyler Van continues to play really good, and then for Oklahoma, isn't it amazing with JV and uh, Oklahoma men's basketball? Isn't it amazing when McCollum goes out and gives you twenty? Uh, typically, good things happen for OU, and it's not like he knocked down every single shot that he took, but he hit an early three, had the layup before that, and uh, you know, obviously, overall shot five for eleven from the floor, two of eight from three. I'm sure he would have liked to have made maybe one or two more from beyond the arc, but uh, he set the tone for what was going to happen for uh, Oklahoma versus BYU. And then defensively, they were really good in the second half. So, yeah, that was a, a big-time win for an OU men's basketball team that could not afford to slip up uh, versus BYU at home. And now they they got to take care of Bedlam at home. That that's Bedlam here and Bedlam there are almost, I think, must-wins for Oklahoma from a resume standpoint, from a locking up an at-large bid and not making things dicey standpoint. Well, and – Amongst your two Bedlam games coming up, you've got top 15 opponents in Baylor, Iowa State, Kansas, and Houston. So you got to take care of business against Oklahoma State because the road is not easy around that. 
in the next six games. So yeah, it, it's a huge stretch coming up for the Sooners and they can really solidify themselves as NCAA tournament, you know, contenders and potentially a, a team that isn't just on the bubble going into the tournament, but can have an opportunity to have a, one of those top eight seeds uh, as we look into March madness, but that's going to do it for today's episode of locked on Sooners. Thanks so much for tuning into the show, being a part of the show, subscribe wherever you get your podcasts. We're free and available on all platforms and on YouTube, hit that notification bell to let you know when new episodes drop, follow Josh on Twitter at Josh on ref myself at John nine Williams. The show is at locked on Sooners, but until next time he's Josh, I'm John Boomer Sooner.